Hildegard of Bingen, German, Hildegard von Bingen, Latin, Hildegardus Bingensis, 1098 to 17 September 1179, also known as Saint Hildegard and Sibyl of the Rhine, was a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, Christian mystic, visionary, and polymath. She is considered to be the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. Hildegard was elected magistra by her fellow nuns in 1136. She founded the monasteries of Rupertsburg in 1150 and Ibingen in 1165. One of her works as a composer, the Ordo Virtutum, is an early example of liturgical drama and arguably the oldest surviving morality play. She wrote theological, botanical, and medicinal texts, as well as letters, liturgical songs, and poems, while supervising miniature illuminations in the Rupertsburg manuscript of her first work, Scivias. She is also noted for the invention of a constructed language known as lingua ignata. Although the history of her formal consideration is complicated, she has been recognized as a saint by branches of the Roman Catholic Church for centuries. On 7 October 2012, Pope Benedict XVI named her a Doctor of the Church. Biography Hildegard was born around the year 1098, although the exact date is uncertain. Her parents were Mechtild of merxheim nahet and Hildebert of Bermersheim, a family of the free lower nobility in the service of the Count Meganhard of Sponheim. Sickly from birth, Hildegard is traditionally considered their youngest and tenth child, although there are records of only seven older siblings. In her Vita, Hildegard states that from a very young age she had experienced visions. <laughs> Monastic life Perhaps because of Hildegard's visions, or as a method of political positioning or both, Hildegard's parents offered her as an oblate to the Benedictine monastery at the de Sibodenberg, which had been recently reformed in the Palatinate Forest. The date of Hildegard's enclosure at the monastery is the subject of debate. Her Vita says she was professed with an older woman, Juda, the daughter of Count Stefan II of Sponheim, at the age of eight. However, Yuda's date of enclosure is known to have been in 1112, when Hildegard would have been 14. Their vows were received by Bishop Otto Bamberg on All Saints' Day, 1112. Some scholars speculate that Hildegard was placed in the care of Yuda at the age of eight, and the two women were then enclosed together six years later. In any case, Hildegard and Yuda were enclosed together at the de Sibodenberg, and formed the core of a growing community of women attached to the male monastery. Yuda was also a visionary and thus attracted many followers who came to visit her at the cloister. Hildegard tells us that Yuda taught her to read and write, but that she was unlearned and therefore incapable of teaching Hildegard sound biblical interpretation. The written record of the life of Yuda indicates that Hildegard probably assisted her in reciting the Psalms, working in the garden and other handiwork, and tending to the sick. This might have been a time when Hildegard learned how to play the ten-stringed psaltery. Volmar, a frequent visitor, may have taught Hildegard simple psalm notation. The time she studied music could have been the beginning of the compositions she would later create. Upon Yuda's death in 1136, Hildegard was unanimously elected as magistra of the community by her fellow nuns. Abbot Kuno of de Sibodenberg asked Hildegard to be prioress, which would be under his authority. Hildegard, however, wanted more independence for herself and her nuns, and asked Abbot Kuno to allow them to move to Rupertsburg. This was to be a move towards poverty, from a stone complex that was well established to a temporary dwelling place. When the abbot declined Hildegard's proposition, Hildegard went over his head and received the approval of Archbishop Henry I of Mainz. Abbot Kuno did not relent until Hildegard was stricken by an illness that kept her paralyzed and unable to move from her bed, an event that she attributed to God's unhappiness at her not following his orders to move her nuns to a new location in Rupertsburg. It was only when the abbot himself could not move Hildegard that he decided to grant the nuns their own monastery. Hildegard and about twenty nuns thus moved to the St. Rupertsburg Monastery in 1150, where Volmar served as provost, as well as Hildegard's confessor and scribe. In 1165 Hildegard founded a second monastery for her nuns at Ibingen. Before Hildegard's death, a problem arose with the clergy of Mainz. A man buried in Rupertsburg had died after excommunication from the church. Therefore, the clergy wanted to remove his body from the sacred ground. 
Hildegard did not accept this idea, replying that it was a sin and that the man had been reconciled to the church at the time of his death. <laughs> Visions Hildegard said that she first saw the shade of the living light at the age of three, and by the age of five she began to understand that she was experiencing visions. She used the term visio, the Latin for vision, to describe this feature of her experience, and recognized that it was a gift that she could not explain to others. Hildegard explained that she saw all things in the light of God through the five senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Hildegard was hesitant to share her visions, confiding only to Yuda, who in turn told Volmar, Hildegard's tutor and, later, secretary. Throughout her life, she continued to have many visions, and in 1141, at the age of 42, Hildegard received a vision she believed to be an instruction from God, to write down that which you see and hear. Still hesitant to record her visions, Hildegard became physically ill. The illustrations recorded in the Book of Scivias were visions that Hildegard experienced, causing her great suffering and tribulations. In her first theological text, Scivias, Know the Ways, Hildegard describes her struggle within, But I, though I saw and heard these things, refused to write for a long time through doubt and bad opinion and the diversity of human words, not with stubbornness but in the exercise of humility, until, laid low by the scourge of God, I fell upon a bed of sickness, then, compelled at last by many illnesses, and by the witness of a certain noble maiden of good conduct the nun Richardes von Stade and of that man whom I had secretly sought and found, as mentioned above, I set my hand to the writing. While I was doing it, I sensed, as I mentioned before, the deep profundity of scriptural exposition, and, raising myself from illness by the strength I received, I brought this work to a close, though just barely, in ten years. And I spoke and wrote these things not by the invention of my heart or that of any other person, but as by the secret mysteries of God I heard and received them in the heavenly places. And again I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Cry out therefore, and write thus. It was between November 1147 and February 1148 at the Synod in Trier that Pope Eugenius heard about Hildegard's writings. It was from this that she received papal approval to document her visions as revelations from the Holy Spirit giving her instant credence. On 17 September 1179, when Hildegard died, her sisters claimed they saw two streams of light appear in the skies and cross over the room where she was dying. Topic. Vita Sancte Hildegardis Hildegard's hagiography, Vita Sancte Hildegardis, was compiled by the monk Theoderic of Echternach after Hildegard's death. He included the hagiographical work Libellus or Little Book, begun by Godfrey of de Sibodenberg. Godfrey had died before he was able to complete his work. Guibert of Gemblu was invited to finish the work, however, he had to return to his monastery with the project unfinished. Theoderic utilized sources Guibert had left behind to complete the Vita. Works Hildegard's works include three great volumes of visionary theology, a variety of musical compositions for use in liturgy, as well as the musical morality play Ordo Virtutum, one of the largest bodies of letters nearly 400 to survive from the Middle Ages, addressed to correspondence ranging from popes to emperors to abbots and abbesses, and including records of many of the sermons she preached in the 1160s and 1170s, two volumes of material on natural medicine and cures, an invented language called the lingua ignata unknown language, and various minor works, including a gospel commentary and two works of hagiography. Several manuscripts of her works were produced during her lifetime, including the illustrated Rupertsburg manuscript of her first major work, Scivias, lost since 1945, the Dendermond Codex, which contains one version of her musical works, and the Ghent manuscript, which was the first fair copy made for editing of her final theological work, the Liber Divinorum Operum. At the end of her life, and probably under her initial guidance, all of her works were edited and gathered into the single recent codex manuscript. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Visionary Theology. Hildegard's most significant works were her three volumes of visionary theology: Scivias, Know the Ways, composed 1142 to 1151, Liber Vitae Meritorum. 
Book of Life's Merits, or Book of the Rewards of Life, composed 1158 1163, and Liber Divinorum Operum, Book of Divine Works, also known as De Operation Dei, On God's Activity, composed 1163 quarters minus 1172 or 1174. In these volumes, the last of which was completed when she was well into her seventies, Hildegard first describes each vision, whose details are often strange and enigmatic, and then interprets their theological contents in the words of the Voice of the Living Light. Scivias with permission from Abbot Kuno of de Sibodenberg, she began journaling visions she had had which is the basis for Scivias. Scivias is a contraction of Sci Vias Domini know the ways of the Lord, and it was Hildegard's first major visionary work, and one of the biggest milestones in her life. Perceiving a divine command to write down what you see and hear, Hildegard began to record and interpret her visionary experiences 26 in total visionary experiences were captured in this compilation. Scivias is structured into three parts of unequal length. The first part six visions chronicles the order of God's creation, the creation and fall of Adam and Eve, the structure of the universe famously described as the shape of an egg, the relationship between body and soul, God's relationship to his people through the synagogue, and the choirs of angels. The second part seven visions describes the order of redemption, the coming of Christ the Redeemer, the Trinity, the Church as the Bride of Christ and the Mother of the Faithful in baptism and confirmation, the orders of the Church, Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the Eucharist, and the fight against the devil. Finally, the third part 13 visions recapitulates the history of salvation told in the first two parts, symbolized as a building adorned with various allegorical figures and virtues. It concludes with the Symphony of Heaven, an early version of Hildegard's musical compositions. In early 1148, a commission was sent by the Pope to de Sibodenberg to find out more about Hildegard and her writings. The commission found that the visions were authentic and returned to the Pope, with a portion of the Scivias. Portions of the uncompleted work were read aloud to Pope Eugenius III at the Synod of Trier in 1148, after which he sent Hildegard a letter with his blessing. This blessing was later construed as papal approval for all of Hildegard's wide-ranging theological activities. Towards the end of her life, Hildegard commissioned a richly decorated manuscript of Scivias the Rupertsburg Codex, although the original has been lost since its evacuation to Dresden for safekeeping in 1945, its images are preserved in a hand-painted facsimile from the 1920s. Liber Vitae Meritorum. In her second volume of Visionary Theology, composed between 1158 and 1163, after she had moved her community of nuns into independence at the Rupertsburg in Bingen, Hildegard tackled the moral life in the form of dramatic confrontations between the virtues and the vices. She had already explored this area in her musical morality play, Ordo Virtutum, and the Book of the Rewards of Life takes up that play's characteristic themes. Each vice, although ultimately depicted as ugly and grotesque, nevertheless offers alluring, seductive speeches that attempt to entice the unwary soul into their clutches. Standing in our defense, however, are the sober voices of the virtues, powerfully confronting every vicious deception. Amongst the work's innovations is one of the earliest descriptions of purgatory as the place where each soul would have to work off its debts after death before entering heaven. Hildegard's descriptions of the possible punishments there are often gruesome and grotesque, which emphasize the work's moral and pastoral purpose as a practical guide to the life of true penance and proper virtue. <laughs> Liber Divinorum Operum Hildegard's last and grandest visionary work had its genesis in one of the few times she experienced something like an ecstatic loss of consciousness. As she described it in an autobiographical passage included in her Vita, sometime in about 1163, she received an extraordinary mystical vision, in which was revealed the sprinkling drops of sweet rain that John the Evangelist experienced when he wrote, In the beginning was the Word. John chapter 1 verse 1. Hildegard perceived that this word was the key to the work of God, of which humankind is the pinnacle. 
The Book of Divine Works, therefore, became in many ways an extended explication of the prologue to John's Gospel. The ten visions of this work's three parts are cosmic in scale, to illustrate various ways of understanding the relationship between God and his creation. Often, that relationship is established by grand allegorical female figures representing divine love or wisdom The first vision opens the work with a salvo of poetic and visionary images, swirling about to characterize God's dynamic activity within the scope of his work within the history of salvation. The remaining three visions of the first part introduce the famous image of a human being standing astride the spheres that make up the universe, and detail the intricate relationships between the human as microcosm and the universe as macrocosm. This culminates in the final chapter of Part 1, Vision 4 with Hildegard's commentary on the prologue to John's Gospel John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14, a direct rumination on the meaning of, In the beginning was the word. The single vision that comprises the whole of Part 2 stretches that rumination back to the opening of Genesis, and forms an extended commentary on the seven days of the creation of the world told in Genesis chapter 1-2-3. This commentary interprets each day of creation in three ways, literal or cosmological, allegorical or ecclesiological i.e. related to the church's history, and moral or tropological i.e. related to the soul's growth in virtue. Finally, the five visions of the third part take up again the building imagery of Scivias to describe the course of salvation history. The final vision contains Hildegard's longest and most detailed prophetic program of the life of the Church from her own days of womanish weakness through to the coming and ultimate downfall of the Antichrist. <laughs> Music Attention in recent decades to women of the medieval church has led to a great deal of popular interest in Hildegard's music. In addition to the Ordo Virtutum, 69 musical compositions, each with its own original poetic text, survive, and at least four other texts are known, though their musical notation has been lost. This is one of the largest repertoires among medieval composers. One of her better known works, Ordo Virtutum, Play of the Virtues, is a morality play. It is uncertain when some of Hildegard's compositions were composed, though the Ordo Virtutum is thought to have been composed as early as 1151. It is an independent Latin morality play with music, comprised of 82 songs, it does not supplement or pay homage to Mass or the office of a certain feast. The most significant part of this entire composition is, however, that the Ordo Virtutum is the earliest known, surviving musical drama that is not attached to a liturgy. This entertainment was both performed and bemused by a select community of noblewomen and nuns. Even more fascinating about this piece, the devil has no music whatsoever in the plot of the play, he instead shouts and bellows all his lines. All other characters sing in monophonic plainchant. This includes patriarchs, prophets, a happy soul, a unhappy soul and a penitent soul along with sixteen female virtues including mercy, innocence, chastity, obedience, hope, and faith. The Ordo Virtutum was probably performed as a manifestation of the theology Hildegard delineated in the Scivias. The play serves as a group enchantment of the Christian story of sin, confession, repentance, and forgiveness. However, it is the female virtues who restore the fallen to the community of the faithful, not the male patriarchs or prophets. This would have been a huge and significant message to the nuns in Hildegard's convent. Scholars assert that the role of the devil would have been played by Volmar, while Hildegard's nuns would have played the parts of anima the human souls and the virtues. In addition to the Ordo Virtutum, Hildegard composed many liturgical songs that were collected into a cycle called the Symphonia Armoniae Celestium Revelationum. The songs from the Symphonia are set to Hildegard's own text and range from antiphons, hymns, and sequences, to responsories. Her music is described as monophonic, that is, consisting of exactly one melodic line. Its style is characterized by soaring melodies that can push the boundaries of the more staid ranges of traditional Gregorian chant. Though Hildegard's music is often thought to stand outside the normal practices of monophonic monastic chant, current researchers are also exploring ways in which it may be viewed in comparison with her contemporaries, such as Hermanus Contractus. Another feature of Hildegard's music that both reflects 12th-century evolutions of chant and pushes those evolutions further is that it is highly melismatic, often with recurrent melodic units. 
Scholars such as Margot Fassler, Marianne Rickert Pfau, and Beverly Lomer also note the intimate relationship between music and text in Hildegard's compositions, whose rhetorical features are often more distinct than is common in 12th century chant. As with all medieval chant notation, Hildegard's music lacks any indication of tempo or rhythm. The surviving manuscripts employ late German style notation, which uses very ornamental neumes. The reverence for the Virgin Mary reflected in music shows how deeply influenced and inspired Hildegard of Bingen and her community were by the Virgin Mary and the saints. The definition of viriditas or greenness is an earthly expression of the heavenly in an integrity that overcomes dualisms. This greenness or power of life appears frequently in Hildegard's works, despite Hildegard's self-professed view that her compositions have as object the praise of God. One scholar has asserted that Hildegard made a close association between music and the female body in her musical compositions. According to him, the poetry and music of Hildegard's Symphonia would therefore be concerned with the anatomy of female desire thus described as Sapphonic, or pertaining to Sappho, connecting her to a history of female rhetoricians. Topic. Scientific and medicinal writings Hildegard's medicinal and scientific writings, though thematically complementary to her ideas about nature expressed in her visionary works, are different in focus and scope. Neither claim to be rooted in her visionary experience and its divine authority. Rather, they spring from her experience helping in and then leading the monastery's herbal garden and infirmary, as well as the theoretical information she likely gained through her wide-ranging reading in the monastery's library. As she gained practical skills in diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, she combined physical treatment of physical diseases with holistic methods centered on spiritual healing. She became well known for her healing powers involving practical application of tinctures, herbs, and precious stones. She combined these elements with a theological notion ultimately derived from Genesis, all things put on earth are for the use of humans. In addition to her hands-on experience, she also gained medical knowledge, including elements of her humoral theory. From traditional Latin texts, Hildegard catalogued both her theory and practice in two works. The first, Physica, contains nine books that describe the scientific and medicinal properties of various plants, stones, fish, reptiles, and animals. The second, Causi et Cure, is an exploration of the human body, its connections to the rest of the natural world, and the causes and cures of various diseases. Hildegard documented various medical practices in these books, including the use of bleeding and home remedies for many common ailments. She also explains remedies for common agricultural injuries such as burns, fractures, dislocations, and cuts. Hildegard may have used the books to teach assistants at the monastery. These books are historically significant because they show areas of medieval medicine that were not well documented because their practitioners mainly women rarely wrote in Latin. Her writings were commentated on by Milani Lipinska, a Polish scientist in addition to its wealth of practical evidence. Kazi et Cure is also noteworthy for its organizational scheme. Its first part sets the work within the context of the creation of the cosmos and then humanity as its summit, and the constant interplay of the human person as microcosm both physically and spiritually with the macrocosm of the universe informs all of Hildegard's approach. Her hallmark is to emphasize the vital connection between the green health of the natural world and the holistic health of the human person. Viriditas, or greening power, was thought to sustain human beings and could be manipulated by adjusting the balance of elements within a person. Thus, when she approached medicine as a type of gardening, it was not just as an analogy. Rather, Hildegard understood the plants and elements of the garden as direct counterparts to the humors and elements within the human body, whose imbalance led to illness and disease. Thus, the nearly 300 chapters of the second book of Kazi et Cure. Explore the etiology, or causes, of disease as well as human sexuality, psychology, and physiology. In this section, she gives specific instructions for bleeding based on various factors, including gender, the phase of the moon, bleeding is best done when moon is waning, the place of disease, use veins near diseased organ of body part, or prevention, big veins in arms, and how much blood to take, described in imprecise measurements, like the amount that a thirsty person can swallow in one gulp. She even includes bleeding instructions for animals to keep them healthy. In the third and fourth sections, Hildegard describes treatments for malignant and minor problems and diseases according to the humoral theory, again including information on animal health. 
The fifth section is about diagnosis and prognosis, which includes instructions to check the patient's blood, pulse, urine and stool. Finally, the sixth section documents a lunar horoscope to provide an additional means of prognosis for both disease and other medical conditions, such as conception and the outcome of pregnancy. For example, she indicates that a waxing moon is good for human conception and is also good for sowing seeds for plants sowing seeds is the plant equivalent of conception. Elsewhere, Hildegard is even said to have stressed the value of boiling drinking water in an attempt to prevent infection, as Hildegard elaborates the medical and scientific relationship between the human microcosm and the macrocosm of the universe. She often focuses on interrelated patterns of four the four elements fire, air, water, and earth, the four seasons, the four humors, the four zones of the earth, and the four major winds. Although she inherited the basic framework of humoral theory from ancient medicine, Hildegard's conception of the hierarchical interbalance of the four humors blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile was unique, based on their correspondence to superior and inferior elements blood and phlegm corresponding to the celestial elements of fire and air, and the two biles corresponding to the terrestrial elements of water and earth. Hildegard understood the disease-causing imbalance of these humors to result from the improper dominance of the subordinate humors. This disharmony reflects that introduced by Adam and Eve in the fall, which for Hildegard marked the indelible entrance of disease and humoral imbalance into humankind. As she writes in Causi et Curé c. 42, It happens that certain men suffer diverse illnesses. This comes from the phlegm which is superabundant within them. For if man had remained in paradise, he would not have had the phlegmata within his body, from which many evils proceed, but his flesh would have been whole and without dark humor lavor. However, because he consented to evil and relinquished good, he was made into a likeness of the earth, which produces good and useful herbs, as well as bad and useless ones, and which has in itself both good and evil moistures. From tasting evil, the blood of the sons of Adam was turned into the poison of semen, out of which the sons of man are begotten and therefore their flesh is ulcerated and permeable to disease. These sores and openings create a certain storm and smoky moisture in men, from which the phlegmata arise and coagulate, which then introduce diverse infirmities to the human body. All this arose from the first evil, which man began at the start, because if Adam had remained in paradise, he would have had the sweetest health, and the best dwelling place, just as the strongest balsam emits the best odor, but on the contrary, man now has within himself poison and phlegm and diverse illnesses. Topic. Lingua ignata and literae ignitae Hildegard also invented an alternative alphabet. Literae ignitae alternate alphabet was another work and was more or less a secret code, or even an intellectual code, much like a modern crossword puzzle today. The text of her writing and compositions reveals Hildegard's use of this form of modified medieval Latin, encompassing many invented, conflated and abridged words. Because of her inventions of words for her lyrics and use of a constructed script, many conlangers look upon her as a medieval precursor. Hildegard's Lingua Ignata unknown language was a composition that was comprised of a series of invented words that corresponded to an eclectic list of nouns. Scholars believe that Hildegard used her Lingua Ignata to increase solidarity among her nuns. Topic: <laughs> Significance During her lifetime Maddox claims that it is likely Hildegard learned simple Latin and the tenets of the Christian faith but was not instructed in the seven liberal arts, which formed the basis of all education for the learned classes in the Middle Ages, the trivium of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric plus the quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. The correspondence she kept with the outside world, both spiritual and social, transcended the cloister as a space of spiritual confinement and served to document Hildegard's grand style and strict formatting of medieval letter writing, contributing to Christian European rhetorical traditions. Hildegard authorized herself as a theologian through alternative rhetorical arts. Hildegard was creative in her interpretation of theology. She believed that her monastery should exclude novices who were not from the nobility because she did not want her community to be divided on the basis of social status. She also stated that, 
Woman may be made from man, but no man can be made without a woman. Because of church limitation on public, discursive rhetoric, the medieval rhetorical arts included preaching, letter writing, poetry, and the encyclopedic tradition. Hildegard's participation in these arts speaks to her significance as a female rhetorician, transcending bans on women's social participation and interpretation of scripture. The acceptance of public preaching by a woman, even a well-connected abbess and acknowledged prophet, does not fit the stereotype of this time. Her preaching was not limited to the monasteries, she preached publicly in 1160 in Germany, New York, Routledge, 2001, 9. She conducted four preaching tours throughout Germany, speaking to both clergy and laity in chapter houses and in public, mainly denouncing clerical corruption and calling for reform. Many abbots and abbesses asked her for prayers and opinions on various matters. She traveled widely during her four preaching tours. She had several devoted followers, including Guibert of Gemblou, who wrote to her frequently and became her secretary after Volmar's death in 1173. Hildegard also influenced several monastic women, exchanging letters with Elizabeth of Schonau, a nearby visionary. Hildegard corresponded with popes such as Eugene III and Anastasius IV, statesmen such as Abbot Sugar, German emperors such as Frederick I Barbarossa, and other notable figures such as Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, who advanced her work, at the behest of her abbot, Cuno, at the Synod of Trier in 1147 and 1148. Hildegard of Bingen's correspondence is an important component of her literary output. Beatification, canonization and recognition as a doctor of the Church Hildegard was one of the first persons for whom the Roman canonization process was officially applied, but the process took so long that four attempts at canonization were not completed and she remained at the level of her beatification. Her name was nonetheless taken up in the Roman martyrology at the end of the 16th century. Her feast day is 17 September. Numerous popes have referred to Hildegard as a saint, including Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. On the 10th of May 2012, Pope Benedict XVI extended the liturgical cult of Saint Hildegard to the entire Catholic Church in a process known as equivalent canonization, thus laying the groundwork for naming her a Doctor of the Church. On the 7th of October 2012, the feast of the Holy Rosary, the Pope named her a Doctor of the Church, the fourth woman of 35 saints given that title by the Roman Catholic Church. He called her perennially relevant and an authentic teacher of theology and a profound scholar of natural science and music. Hildegard of Bingen also appears in the calendar of saints of various Anglican churches, such as that of the Church of England, in which she is commemorated on the 17th of September. Hildegard's parish and pilgrimage church in Ibingen near Rudesheim houses her relics. Topic: <inaudible> Modern interest. In recent years, Hildegard has become of particular interest to feminist scholars. They note her reference to herself as a member of the weaker sex and her rather constant belittling of women. Hildegard frequently referred to herself as an unlearned woman, completely incapable of biblical exegesis. Such a statement on her part, however, worked to her advantage because it made her statements that all of her writings and music came from visions of the divine more believable, therefore giving Hildegard the authority to speak in a time and place where few women were permitted a voice. Hildegard used her voice to amplify the Church's condemnation of institutional corruption, in particular simony. Hildegard has also become a figure of reverence within the contemporary New Age movement, mostly because of her holistic and natural view of healing, as well as her status as a mystic. Though her medical writings were long neglected, and then studied without reference to their context, she was the inspiration for Dr. Gottfried Hertzke's Hildegard Medicine and is the namesake for June Boyce Tillman's Hildegard Network, a healing center that focuses on a holistic approach to wellness and brings together people interested in exploring the links between spirituality, the arts, and healing. Her reputation as a medicinal writer and healer was also used by early feminists to argue for women's rights to attend medical schools. Hildegard's reincarnation has been debated since 1924 when Austrian mystic Rudolf Steiner lectured that a nun of her description was the past life of Russian poet-philosopher Vladimir Soloviev, whose Sofianic visions are often compared to Hildegard's. 
Sophiologist Robert Powell writes that Hermetic astrology proves the match, while mystical communities in Hildegard's lineage include that of artist Carl Schroeder as studied by Columbia sociologist Courtney Bender and supported by reincarnation researchers Walter Semkew and Kevin Ryerson. Recordings and performances of Hildegard's music have gained critical praise and popularity since 1979. See discography listed below. The following modern musical works are directly linked to Hildegard and her music or texts. Sophia Gubaidulina, Aus den Visionen der Hildegard von Bingen, for Contra Alto Solo, after a text of Hildegard of Bingen, 1994. Peter Janssen's, Hildegard von Bingen, a musical in ten scenes, text, Uta Richter, 1997. Tilo Medic, Monitzbilder, Natch Hildegard von Bingen, Twelve Songs for Mezzo Soprano, Clarinet and Piano, 1997. David Lynch with Jocelyn Montgomery, Lux Vivens, Living Light, The Music of Hildegard von Bingen, 1998. Alois Albrecht, Hildegard von Bingen, A Liturgical Play with Texts and Music by Hildegard of Bingen, 1998. Christopher Theophanidis, Rainbow Body, for Orchestra, 2000. Ludger Stuhlmeier, O Splendidissima Gemma, for alto solo and organ, text by Hildegard of Bingen, 2011. Wolfgang Sassang, Division Secunda for double choir and percussion, 2011. Devendra Banhart, for Hildegard von Bingen, single from the 2013 album Mala. Gordon Hamilton, The Trillion Souls quotes Hildegard's O Igni Spiritist artwork The Dinner Party features a play setting for Hildegard, in space, the minor planet 898 Hildegard is named for her, in film, Hildegard has been portrayed by Patricia Routledge in a BBC documentary called Hildegard of Bingen 1994, by Angela Molina in Barbarossa 2009, and by Barbara Sukawa in the film Vision, directed by Margareta von Trotta, Hildegard was the subject of a 2012 fictionalized biography graphic novel Illuminations by Mary Sherratt, the plant genus Hildegardia is named after her because of her contributions to herbal medicine. Hildegard makes an appearance in the Baby Sitters Club No. 101, Claudia Kishi, middle school dropout by Ann M. Martin, when Anna Stevenson dresses as Hildegard for Halloween. A feature documentary film, The Unruly Mystic, St. Hildegard, was released by American director Michael M. Conti in 2014. Bibliography Topic Primary sources Editions of Hildegard's work Hildegardus Bingensis, Opera Minora II, edited by C. P. Evans, J. Deployg, S. Moens, M. M. Bach, K. Gartner, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 226a Turnhout, Breppels, 2015, ISBN 978-2503548371 Hildegardus Bingensis, Opera Minora, edited by H. Feiss, C. Evans, B. M. Keenzel, C. Music. B. Newman, P. Drong, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 226 Turnhout, Breppels, 2007, ISBN 978-2503052618 Hildegardus Bingensis. Work Band IV. Leader Symphonie. Edited by Barbara Stuhlmeier. Borner Kunstverlag 2012. ISBN 978-3870712631. Leader Otto Muller Verlag Salzburg 1969, Modern Edition in Adapted Square Notation Marianne Rickert Pfau, Hildegard von Bingen, Symphonia, 8 volumes. Complete Edition of the Symphonia Chants, Bryn Mawr, Hildegard Publishing Company, 1990. Beate Hildegardus Cause et Cure, ed. L. Moulinier Berlin, Akademie Verlag, 2003 Epistolarium pars prima ixc edited by L. van Acker, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 91a Turnhout, Breppels, 1991 Epistolarium pars secunda xci cclr edited by L. van Acker, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 91a Turnhout, Breppels, 1993 Epistolarium pars tertia ccli ccc CXC edited by L. Van Acker and M. Claes Hackmaller, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis XCIB Turnhout, Breppels, 2001 Scivius. A. Furcater, A. Carlovaris eds, Corpus Christianorum Scholars Version Vols. 43, 43a, Turnhout, Breppels, 2003 Liber Vitae Meritorum. A. Carlovaris ed. 
Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 90 Turnhout, Breppels, 1995 Liber Divinorum Operum. A. de Rolls and P. Dronk eds, Corpus Christianorum Continuatio Medievalis CCCM 92 Turnhout, Breppels, 1996 Hildegard of Bingen, Two Hagiographies, Vita Sancti Ruperti Confessori, Vita Sancti Dicebati Episcopi, ed., and trans. Hugh Feiss and Christopher P. Evans, Dallas Medieval Texts and Translations 11 Leuven and Paris, Peters, 2010 Hildegard of Bingen's Unknown Language, an edition, translation, and discussion, ed. Sarah Higley 2007 The Entire Recentcodex Glossary, with additions from the Berlin MS, translations into English, and extensive commentary Early Manuscripts of Hildegard's work Wiesbaden, Hessische Landsbibliothek, MS2 Recent Codex or Wiesbaden Codex c. 1180-85 Dendermond, Belgium, Street Peters and Paluzabdij Cod. 9 Villarenzer Codex C 1174/75 Leipzig University Library St Thomas 371 Paris BIBL Nat MS 1139 München University Library MS 2 Infinity 156 Topic Other Sources Friedrich Wilhelm Emil Roth Glossy Hildegardus, in, Elias Steinmeier and Eduard Sievers eds, Die Althochdeutschen Glossen, Vol. 3, Zurich, Wiedmann, 1895, 1965, pp. 390-404. Analecta Sancte Hildegardus, in Analecta Sacra Vol. 8 edited by Jean-Baptiste Pitra Monte Cassino, 1882. Petrologia Latina Vol. 197 1855. Explanatio Reguli S. Benedicti Explanatio Symboli S. Athanasi Homilia Lviii in Evangelia Hymenidia Coelestis Ignata Lingua, cum versione Latina Liber Divinorum Operum Simplicis Hominis 1163-7374 Liber Vitae Meritorum 1158-63 Libri Simplicis et Compositi Medicina Physica, sive subtilitatum diversarum naturarum creaturarum libri noam Scivias seu visiones 1141-51 Solutions triginta octo questionum Tractatus de sacramento alteris See also Discography of Hildegard of Bingen Timeline of Women in Science Notes <laughs> <laughs>